All right, good evening, everyone. Um, we are picking up on lesson four, uh, our need for grace. And the topic that we're going to be looking at is the fall into sin. So we left off last lesson with Adam and Eve, um, the creation, um, kind of talking about the differences a little bit between the, the approach, the language of creation and evolution. Um, and, and when we stopped at the end of chapter three um, or the end of chapter two, everything looked great. Um, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, marriage was there. Adam and Eve were there. Everything was great. Um, and then we're going to move into chapter three where it all falls apart. All right. So as part of kind of an intro, uh, think about this question. <clears throat> How do you think the average human being would rate the rest of humanity on a scale from one to 10. Now notice 10 is not perfect, right? No one would say that. Um, but how do you think 10 is basically good? One is bad to the bone. How do you think the average person would rate humanity? Five. <clears throat> Six to seven. Six to seven. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, that's true. Um, I think you hear this though a lot, don't you? You hear this from people um, where, you know, they say at least like, I like to think that everyone is basically good, right? We all make mistakes, but. Um, I, I think if you would say six or seven or five, I think you'd be a little low uh, from what the average person would say. And call it hope or call it a, a desire to see the best in people, whatever it might be. But I think this is what you hear a lot of people say. I, I think most people are basically good. Now, some people, you're going to have the bad eggs, the bad apples, whatever you want to compare them to. Uh, but I think a lot of people would would, would probably be closer to 10 than we would think. Um, the follow-up question is, would you agree? <laughs> now I think it comes back to, yeah, who do you know? Um, <clears throat> look at yourself, right? Start, start with you. Um, start at one, yeah. Uh, take a look in your, uh, your notes there. It's even more interesting to see what people think of themselves when compared to others. So if this is, you know, you rating all of humanity, now where do you fit in, right? <clears throat> Take a look at the following quotation. I'm on page 21, right? It's 21 in your notes, lesson four. Okay. Um, take a look at the following quote from an article titled, Amazing Sin, How Deep We're Bound, that appeared in the May 2004 edition of Christianity Today. The author says, part of our mess is not knowing we are a mess. Most of us in contemporary life have never participated in the evil of slavery, never been convicted of a felony, never abused a child. Sometimes we don't feel a pressing need for grace because we do not see our sin as particularly troublesome. A robust finding from social science research is that most people think they are better than others, more ethical, considerate, industrious, cooperative, fair, and loyal, People think they obey the Ten Commandments more consistently than others. One polling expert noted, I love this, it's the great contradiction that the average person believes he is better than the average person. Again, we, we talked about this a little bit in lesson one when it came to our three man-made solutions to our problem with the law, right? One was try better. The other one was do more good than bad. The third one was, which I think is probably the most common, but not one that we would ever admit out loud. And that is compare yourself to other people. So it's, you know, we kind of picture heaven as this long line. We've all got a number and you're just hoping, you're praying, you're begging that the person in front of you and the person after you um, is like a, you know, convict. Um, because God's got to let someone into heaven. And as long as I'm kind of on the, you know, the, the higher, you know, curve, um, then, I, then I should be okay. And that's, that's how we tend to view ourselves. Um, I haven't done this. I've done that. I've never been convicted of a crime. I've never, you know, participated in some of these horrible, horrible, awful things. Um, and so, yeah, I'm probably better than most people. 
uh, even though just to say that should sound weird, right? Should make you feel uncomfortable, but that is, that's our nature. If, 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 if you, if you want to know kind of how problematic our sinful nature is, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, um, it's ask somebody that question. How do you view yourselves in comparison to the average person in the world, right? Um, so this is what we're going to look at. Here's our lesson goal. Look at the bottom of page 21. In our first lesson, we learned about the Bible's two basic teachings, law and gospel, the bad news, the good news, what God demands and what God promises. We learned that the law showed us our sin. This lesson is going to help us understand how sin came into God's perfect world and how far reaching the effects of sin are. We'll also learn how God dealt with sin upon its entrance into our world and how he graciously designed a plan that would deal with sin's deadly effects. All right, so we're going to begin by looking at Genesis chapter 3. If you've got a Bible with you and you want to look it up, you can. Otherwise, it'll be up here on the screen. Um, as you look at the top of page 22 in your notes, here's just kind of a little intro you see. The previous two chapters stated in our last lesson uh, that we studied in our last lesson taught us about the perfect world that God created. Unfortunately, things didn't remain that way. We don't know how long it did. We don't know the time period between the end of Genesis 2 and the beginning of, of chapter 3. Um, it sure doesn't seem like there was a whole lot of time. Um, sure seems like this happened pretty quickly. But chapter 3 of the book of Genesis shows us how sin came into our world and destroyed the perfect paradise that God had created for us. All right, so chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Does anybody want to read? You don't have to, but I like to... I don't want to be the only one who talks, but I will if you don't want to. All right, it's got to be good and loud, Peter, so they can hear you online. <laughs> now the serpent was more clever than any wild animal which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but not from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. God has said you shall not eat from it. You shall not touch it or else you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. In fact, God knows that the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. All right. Thank you. Just a couple of uh, bullet points there in your notes on some of these words. I'm sure you have some questions as we, we read through those. So I want to try and address those. Number one, who is the serpent mentioned? Um, this kind of comes out of left field, right? All of a sudden, Adam and Eve are there, and this serpent shows up and starts talking. Um, who is the serpent mentioned? Well, there's a number of, of other Bible passages that tell us, right? Revelation chapter 12, it says, uh, that, of course, this is the vision that John is getting of kind of the, the end of time. And it says the great dragon was hurled down. Okay, well, who's the dragon? That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. All right. Matthew 25, um, Jesus talks about that. This is Jesus uh, foreshadowing and kind of giving to his disciples the picture of what will judgment day look like. And Jesus says, I'm going to come back and separate all people like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. There's going to be those on his right. There's going to be those on his left. And here's what he says to those on his left. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Second Peter chapter 4 kind of tells us how did this happen? Where did the devil come from? Peter writes, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. And then a little later on in, in the New Testament, we get this picture. The angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So put all of those passages together and tell me, where did the devil come from? Up 
Heaven. Yeah. Um, because this is the question that is often asked. Did God create the devil? God made everything. Did God create the devil? And the answer to that is sort of. Obviously, he, he created him, but he did not create him to be evil. He did not create him to be this disastrous, deceitful serpent. Um, he, uh, the devil was one of the, the good angels that God created. In fact, the Bible tells us that his name is Lucifer, which is a name that means light bearer. Um, that's a good name, right? Um, to be the one who heralds and brings light to the world. Um, this is who God created. And yet, what do we see? God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell. The angels who do not keep their positions of authority, but abandon their own home, these he has kept in darkness. Sin did not come into the physical realm, right? Into the, the, the physical created order that God made. Angels and human beings are not part of the same created order. They're spirit beings. They're spiritual beings. Um, and so they're, they're different than you and I. So, so angels sinned, but that did not affect Adam and Eve in the sense that that didn't bring all of creation down because they're a different part of God's created order. But this is now what the devil wants to do, is he wants to take that sin. He wants to take that deceitfulness. He wants to drag the rest of God's creation down to hell with him. So this is when he infiltrates now um, the physical realm. Well, God didn't create it. Um, why did God allow it to happen? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it just, it seems like, um, here's, here's my kind of reading between the lines a little bit. You read some of the rest of the Bible passages on angels, and why did God create angels? Um, angels are ministers servants and spirits of God. But what does God command them to serve? Not just him. But Psalm 91 says, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. We talked about this in our last lesson. Hum human beings, mankind, Adam and Eve, were the crown of God's creation, not angels. God did not create everything and then say, angels, this is all for you. No, it was for Adam and Eve. And part of that was for the angels to serve and guard and to take care of Adam and Eve. Now, I, I tend to think when it, when it talks about the angels who, do not, who did not keep their positions of authority, well, angels are much more powerful than you and I are. Um, and yet... God said, despite being so much more powerful than Adam or Eve or people, you are going to serve them. And I think this idea of not keeping their position of authority was, God, I'm not serving something that's weaker than I am. Now, a lot of people talk about how, well, the devil wanted to overtake God, wanted to unseat God. And, I, and I'm sure that's part of it. But I, I tend to think the frustration more than that was um, you've created me, you've given me all this power, and then you've told me to go and serve a physical finite creature. That's demeaning. I'm not going to do that. I'm out of here. Um, and they abandon their own home. Um, and so what does it seem like the very first place now that the devil goes to attack is the very creature he was created to serve and to protect. Um, so, yeah, why did it happen? I, I think it's part of this picture and this conversation that we'll get into, and you and I have a lot, this whole idea of a, of a free will, right? Um, God commands his angels, and yet they do so lovingly, willingly. Um, it's not that they're, they do it because they have no other choice. Um, and so here's what a group of angels, the book of Revelation has this picture, and it says about a third of the angels fell. 
Yeah, so it's not just, you know, the devil and a couple of his drinking buddies. Um, this is a big group, a powerful group of angels. Um, we'll He's the leader. He's the leader. I don't know if I would say more powerful, but he is the leader. Um, and so um, where did the serpent come from? This is it, right? God created him to be one of the good angels. He did not keep his position of authority. He sinned. He abandoned his own home, um, all of these things. And now he's in this gloomy dungeon and he hates every bit of it. And the only comfort he finds is making sure that he can bring other people to suffer with him. Misery loves company. And here it is, right? Um, and so he goes to attack the very part of God's creation that he was originally created to serve. Now we're, we're, we're in this time period where um, the devil and his angels, demons, whatever you want to call them, um, they have a little bit of free reign here on earth. Um, and so the, the book of Revelation will talk about how the, the devil is kind of on a chain, right? And so what happens if you see like a mean dog tied to a chain? If you're within that that radius of the chain, you're in, in danger, right? If you're outside of it, you're okay. Um, and the picture here is, well, how far does the chain extend? Well, it allows him to wreak havoc in the world. And that's what he does. Um, and so, you know, one of the names that Jesus, the most common name that Jesus uses to refer to the devil is the prince of this world. This is, this is his, his sandbox, this is his playground. This is where he can go and do his damage for now. Um, we're within the radius of that chain. But the time is coming and the day will come when he is finally cast into that lake of fire, never to be heard from by any of us again, right? But that won't happen until the last day, right? It seems seems like they, they, they all still kind of have that limited mobility here on earth. The gospel reading we'll hear on Sunday is, is an example of a man who was possessed by a legion of demons, right? And we see, we see that, that demon possession, that's something that Jesus encounters a lot during his ministry. And people, people often ask, well, it seems like this was way more prevalent back in Jesus' day than it is now. And I don't know whether or not that's true. Um, but if it were true, I think there's an explanation for it. And that would just simply be, it, it's sort of like, if you're a fan of football, right? Um, you play defense differently when you're on the 50 yard line than you do when you're backed up against the goal line. When the offense, when the team is about, you know, a foot from, from scoring six points, you play defense a little differently than you do when they're on the 50 yard line. And I think, you know, if there were more cases of demon possession during the life and ministry of Jesus, the explanation would be they understand and realize if we can stop Jesus, that's the game. We don't have to worry about overtaking the whole world. All we have to do is stop Jesus from crossing the goal line. Um, and so it's that kind of blitzing pressure that the devil is putting on Jesus, because if they can trip up, if they can stop, if they can, can tempt and successfully um, overtake Jesus, then, 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 then the entire world is lost, right? Again, I, I'm not saying that, that it necessarily was more common, but if it were, if that actually is the case, and it could very well be, I think that's why. Um, How do the good angels uh, work in this environment where they have a legion of How do the good angels work in this environment? Constantly. Yeah. It is a tough job, which is why 
you know, I like to remind people that your great grandma is not an angel in heaven. Okay. Um, we need, we need to stop thinking about our, our loved ones in heaven as being angels. Um, saints, believers who are now in heaven are greater than the angels, right? Don't, don't let your loved one go to heaven and immediately put them to work. Well, now they got to watch over me and they got to, I don't want my, no offense. I mean, I try to live a moral life, but I, I don't want my great grandma looking over my entire life 24 um, seven. That's just an uncomfortable thought, right? Um, the, the, the angels have been given this immense power. They're powerfully spiritual creatures and we need them to be that way. Um, and I think one of the, um, one of the really cool um, sections that, that talk about that is in Ephesians chapter six, I believe, right? Yeah, Ephesians six, so the last chapter of Ephesians, Paul writes this. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, which as Christians, that's all we tend to focus on. If we could just get this law passed, if we could just outlaw this immoral action, if we could just do this in the world, then Christianity would really start to be humming, right? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In, in a way, it is, right? The world, the unbelieving world around us is something that attacks our faith, faith. But this is what Paul writes. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so, for example, Martin Luther will say, um, if, if the good angels were not constantly watching over you, if they were not constantly fighting for you, you and I would not live another second. That's what they're up to. Um, it's not just the, the random miraculous moments where you avoid a car accident and, oh, my, my angel is watching over me, sure. It is literally every second of your life. Like if, if I, I, I kind of hope, I don't, I don't have anything to support this, but I kind of hope it'd be nice to go back when we get to heaven and look at your life and see how many and all the ways that God's angels preserved you. We would have plenty of gripes and complaining to say, well, this bad thing happened in my life and this bad thing happened and where were you, God, when? And why weren't the angels doing this? And I wish God could just say, here it is. Here's the real of how many angels and how many hours they worked just watching over you. Do you know what would have happened if they weren't there at that moment 35, 40, 80 years ago? But they were. Um. And so it's, it's this idea that the devil cannot defeat God, right? He tried. He tried here. And God threw him out of heaven. He tried this rebellion to take over God, but he couldn't do it. So what does the devil do now? Now he's left to attack God's precious property, his most prized possessions, and that's you and me. And so he attacks the devil, or he attacks God by attacking us. And so how does God combat that? He sends his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Um, and, and I like the way Luther uses the example of Holy Communion. And he says, if, if you and I could see how many flaming arrows were fired at us every moment of the day, we would not walk, we would run to Holy Communion. To be given that, that comfort, that forgiveness, that protection, um, that, that's, that's one example that he uses. So, so how, do the, how do the good angels work in this, this atmosphere? Nonstop. 
right? It's, it's, it's become one of my favorite non kind of big festival Sundays of the church here every Sunday. The, the last Sunday in September is the, uh, the festival of St. Michael and all saints. Um, yeah, or all angels, sorry. Um, the festival of St. Michael and all angels. It's an opportunity for us to talk about angels, to look at some of these passages in the Bible. Um, and so, you know, people will mock the United States of America um, because one of the very few things that we lead the world in is the percentage of people who still believe in angels. Because the world looks at it and says, what are angels? Well, they, they look at, you know, touched by an angel, right? Or they watch a movie or they see the little chubby cherubim. And these are the things that they tend to think, no, read the Bible. And I love, I love this. Whenever an angel shows up, what is almost always the very first thing the angel has to say? Don't be afraid. Because your natural reaction to seeing an angel would be straight up terror. I mean, that's the implication. The first thing the angel has to say is don't be afraid. So it's not these like effeminate looking men with harps and wings that are just floating around and nice and lovey-dovey. And um, No, these are warriors. Um, at the end of chapter three, what are we going to see? The Lord puts angels to protect the entrance back into the garden because God doesn't want Adam and Eve to eat from the, the, the tree of life and live in their fallen state forever. And you remember what the picture is? It's a flaming sword. That's the picture. This is who is protecting you. These are God's warriors. That's what angels are. Um, and, and so no offense to my, my grandma, my great grandparents, I don't want them charged with the, 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 uh, uh, the task of, of going to war for me. God has created specific creatures to do that. And here, a group of them said, no, I don't want it. I don't want to do that. It's beneath me. So they rebelled and God threw them out. So in the tree of life versus the we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We're not even there yet. Okay. Just hold on. Okay. No. Otherwise, we're never going to get any, anywhere in this lesson. I always think about why would grandma or anybody want to be looking back to earth? Because that brings pain. Right. When you're in heaven, there is no pain. Yeah. No suffering. So why would we want to? It's a sentimental thing that we say to try and keep our loved ones close to us, right? I get it. I totally get it, right? Um, I don't want, because I'm never going to forget my grandma, and I don't want her to forget me. And so it's this whole picture of how do I keep her close? Well, I, you know, this, it's a cultural thing. She turns into an angel. And now she's my guardian angel. Um, but again, all of that you can say only if you think about things like the devil and hell and sin and death, only if those things are just, you know, like you know, trite things, things that, you know, that can be toyed with. But when you start to realize and understand what is at stake and what we're really up against, when you hear the apostle Paul say these evil forces, um, these spiritual enemies, you, the most dangerous things to your physical, spiritual, mental, emotional health in this life are enemies that you and I cannot even see. Oh, that's a scary thing. This is a really big deal. What is God doing about it? He's created thousands and thousands and millions and millions and countless numbers of these powerful spiritual warriors whose job is to bring glory to God by guarding and protecting you. Let grandma enjoy heaven. Let grandma just be there in the presence of Jesus, um, living it up, loving life, finally being free from sin, pain. Let the angels worry about you. Um, and that's what they do. All right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, review Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, to understand the subject of this debate between Satan and Eve. So, so uh, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
the woman said, well, no, we're allowed to eat from fruit, but not from this tree. Where does that come from? Back in Genesis 2, we looked at this last week. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay. Um, that is what God said. Uh, the devil is now calling that into question. Um, notice Satan's approach. First, he starts out with a flat-out lie, right? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? No, God didn't say that. But he's, he's starting a nice conversation. He's, he's getting Eve to, to kind of, pardon the pun, but he's getting Eve to bite, right? Um, the, the, and the half-truth, verse 4 and 5. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. You're not, it's not like you're going to drop dead immediately. But God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, how and in what fashion did God make Adam and Eve? You remember the phrase? Let us make mankind in our image how were adam and eve going to do something that was going to make them more like god they were already created in his very image but he's got eve thinking it's a half truth did adam and eve and eve have this perfect knowledge of good and evil no they didn't that's why the name of the tree was what it is they did not know evil in an experiential sense. They didn't know evil in the sense of what does it mean to die? They, they didn't know any of this, right? Um, so were they going to know more in that sense if they ate the fruit? Yes, but what did God know if they did? Though your knowledge, quote unquote, might increase, everything else will be lost. Um, Notice Eve's first response. She says, um, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Was, was she deliberately exaggerating here? Or do you think she was simply saying we don't want to go there in her own words? God didn't say don't touch it. He said, you can eat from any tree, but not that one. And when you eat it, you will die. He didn't say they couldn't touch it. So she did understand what it was about. Well, she knows the command. She doesn't know what it's like to die in the sense that nothing has ever died. What does that mean? Right? But she knows this is what God has told us. I think this is, if you look back, we talked at this, we talked about this last week. Um, God gave this first command to Adam, right? He hasn't created Eve yet. He says, Adam, everything is for your food except for that tree, right? Um, and, and I think now he gives this command and, and Adam is now entrusted with loving and taking care of and, 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 and providing for his wife in that sense of physically and spiritually loving her and cherishing her. Um, and so Adam is now the one who communicates it. And can't you see Adam? I mean, this is kind of the way you, know, you do this with, with, with children, right? You do this when you're, you're training someone at your job. Um, you, you don't just say, um, you know, don't touch the stove. You say what? Don't even go into the kitchen when mom's cooking because nothing good will come of this, right? Um, what, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you tell somebody you're training at your job, right? Um, this is the, this is the, the file that will just melt down your whole computer. Um, if you go in there and you click on this, this, and this, um, it's the reboot system, whatever it is. You say, don't even click on the file, right? Nothing good will come of that, right? You, you tell people, if you know this is a dangerous thing, if I see my kids outside playing, um, I don't just say, don't go into the road. I say, I don't even want you to cross the sidewalk, right? 
I think this is what Eve is communicating is probably what Adam communicated to her. God has given us every plant, every tree, all of this for food, except for that one. But when we eat of it, we're going to die. So don't even go near it. Don't even give it a second thought. Um, Adam and Eve were created innocent. They had no knowledge about evil. Um, hence the name of the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, here's the question that everybody asks, and it's a good question. The question is, why did God create the tree in the first place? Seems like everything would have gone better if God had only not created the tree. Here's the answer. God always wants to be worshipped in faith. Now, what does that mean, to worship in faith? It means that you trust the word of God over and against whatever evidence you see in front of you. That I am going to trust the words and promises of God, even though what I see, what I feel, what I think, what I perceive is the exact opposite. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see, the writer to the Hebrews tells us. You are believing and trusting in the words and promises of God, despite what your eyes, your stomach, your heart, whatever, tells you otherwise. So here's the thing. When God calls you and me to trust in him, he says things like, everything's going to be okay. And he says things like, I forgive you. And I love you. And this perfect place called heaven is your eternal home. He makes us these promises of good blessings, even in the midst of what? Sin, temptation, pain, suffering, death. All of these things that you and I know and experience, God promises the opposite. In the face of death, he says, I'm going to resurrect you. I've never seen somebody raised to life. Um, he says, heaven is going to be your, your eternal home. I don't know what heaven is like. I've never been there. He says, I forgive you all your sins. And I say, yeah, but Jesus, I got a lot of them. And I still feel guilty. Faith says, I trust the word of God over and against what I see and feel and want and think. So how does God call Adam and Eve to worship him by faith when they are already living in heaven? When they are already experiencing a perfect existence? God says, I want you to trust me that if you eat of this tree, all of this will go away. And so Adam and Eve worship God in faith by avoiding this one simple thing. What is death like? I don't know. But God says we don't want it. And God says the way that we get what we don't want is to eat of that tree. And so we worship God and we trust that what he says is right. Even though, as we're going to see, what does Eve notice? As she creeps closer toward the tree, she sees that it looks pretty good. Not only does the fruit look good, but the, the potential of what it could give me. The desire for gaining wisdom, she says, that's pretty nice. And so this is when people talk about, you stupid Christians, you believe that the, the reason that the world is in such disarray is because a woman 10,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, whatever it is, ate, took a bite from an apple. That's like Snow White stuff. That's fairy tale stuff. It's got nothing to do with the apple. That's not the point. The point is Adam and Eve stopped trusting God and his word over and against what they saw, what they thought, what they wanted. It was that they put more trust in the words of the serpent than they did in the words of God. 
So to you and me, it seems like, well, if God just hadn't created the tree, um, then everything would have been great. And they would also not have had a way to worship God. They would not have had a way to exercise faith and trust in God. And God always wants to be worshiped in faith. And so it requires God to promise them something that they cannot see. And that thing that they cannot see, that they have not experienced, was death. Just like now for you and me, I have not experienced a resurrection. I have not seen heaven. Faith. I trust that it's coming. I trust that it's real. I trust the words and promises of God over and against what I look at and see when I look into the casket. That's faith. That's what God desires. And so in order to inspire and instill that in Adam and Eve, who are living the perfect existence, God had to promise them something that they had not experienced. And the only thing they're missing out on is sin and death. And God says, trust me, you don't want it. And think about how easy it was to avoid. It's not as though God gave them two trees. And the good tree that they could eat from was not really great. And the bad tree that he does not want them to eat from was just flush with the greatest fruit that, that you could imagine. God literally put them in the middle of a garden filled with fruits and vegetables. It was paradise. And God said, it's all for you. And I want you to trust me. I want you to worship me by not eating that one tree. And so, I mean, we see this in the rest of the Bible, even after the fall into sin, that God has provided for us so richly that you and I have no need to sin. Have you thought about that? We do not have the need to sin. Why do we then? Because we want to. Why does Eve eat from the tree? Because she wants to. This is what sin is. This is how fallen our sinful nature now is. We know what God wants. We know what God says. But this is what I want. And so I'm going to go do it. And we think that we know better. We think that it's going to be better. We think that it's going to be more beneficial for us, that it's going to bring us some joy and happiness. And what happens, typically? We find out very soon this was not good whether it's from guilt, whether it's from the ramifications, the, 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 the effects of, of sin that you and I commit. Um, so, yeah. So Satan said she would not be she would have good and evil, but she already knew the good, so we don't think she was really going to be good. Right. Yep. All right, so let's take a look then at that section, verses six through eight. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here it is, first bullet point there under verses six through eight. Eve became convinced that God was holding out on them. This is the sin. She's convinced that the word of the devil is better for her than the word of God. God said, don't eat it. The devil said, it'll be good. So when I look at it, what does she see? That the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. It hits all of the senses, right? Mm-hmm. 
My point is, this is the sin. She, she has, unlike you and me, she has a perfectly free will. Meaning that she can continue to live a sin-free life. She can do things that are perfect in the eyes of God. She can live a sinless existence. She has that ability. She has that choice. She has that option. That's what it means to have a free will. That I can choose to not sin anymore. I don't have that ability. I, I could try my best. I could lock myself in a closet for the rest of my life and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove myself from all temptations. And people try this. This was the, the original intent of monks and, and nunneries and monasteries and all those things was if we just remove ourselves from society, we'll be able to live that much more of a holy life. Well, the irony of it is, what does God call us and command us as Christians to do? To love our neighbor. And so when you remove from your life your neighbors, guess what you can't do anymore? You can't do things that are pleasing to God. Um, and so the sin is not the, the, the action of eating the fruit. It is this right here. This is the fall. It is her using her perfectly free will to say, I don't want to do what God says anymore. I want to do what the devil says. That's the sin, right? I, I would go so far as to say, even if she had, did not eat the fruit, if this was just the thought, if this was just the temptation, right? Um, here it is, right? There's the fall into sin. The action, the, the actual eating of the fruit is just the evidence of what was already going on in her, her mind and her heart. And Jesus talks about this too. Um, so again, let's say I could, if I could stop myself from doing any sort of physical thing, I can't fix my heart. The hatred that we feel in our hearts toward people, the, 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 the lustful thoughts that I have, right? I mean, unless I'm cutting my heart out and I'm doing a, a brain lobotomy, you know, well, then I'm not alive anymore. But like, these are the things that are literally necessary if you want to actually try and remove sin from my life, because that's how deeply embedded this problem is. So, so with her free will now, she looks at that and says, I like this option. Even though God has said, don't do it. I think it's a better option than what God has told me to do. And that's the sin. <coughs> that makes sense? Yep. But it doesn't mean they were incapable of sinning. That's what I mean to say when I say she had a free will. They were capable of sin. Um, they didn't have the knowledge of evil in the sense that she had not had those kinds of thoughts. She had not experienced what it means to, to do evil, to, to have evil done to her. She hadn't experienced any of that. Um, it doesn't mean that she was perfect in the sense that she was incapable of sinning. She had that ability, obviously, we see that, but she had not exercised it. Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk more about it later, I'm sure. Um, notice the comment about Adam, he was with her. And so, yeah, I, I guess you could say technically, Eve was the first one to eat the fruit. But I would even say, maybe even before all of that, Adam is the one. The rest of the Bible holds Adam accountable for the first sin and not Eve. Why? Because God put Adam in charge. Um, and he's there to, to take care of his wife, to, 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 to remove her from that situation. And you can almost kind of envision Adam sitting there while his wife is talking to the devil, saying, Yeah, I wonder what's going to happen. Eat the fruit. You know, tell me what it's like. And it's like, you know, how the first sin you could say was almost Adam's failure to love his wife. Um, because while the devil goes to Eve first, God comes to Adam first, right? You were in charge. You were responsible 
for protecting and loving your wife and you failed. She ate the fruit. You were right there with her. And he's silent through this whole thing. There's no Eve, stop it. Let's get out of here. Stop talking to him. Nothing good will come of this. The guy who said, right, God said, don't eat it, eat from it. So let's not even go near it. Now watches as his wife wanders closer to him. And he's silent. Adam was with him. Innocence lost. They are ashamed to be naked because they no longer have perfect control over their thoughts. They are afraid when they hear God and so they hide from him. Isn't this interesting? What do they choose to cover first? They make fig leaf coverings for themselves. They, they cover their, their, their genitals. They cover the parts of their body that make them different. And, and, and it doesn't really make any sense other than this flood of lustful thoughts and you know, damaging uh, perceptions. Because you know, it would have made sense after the fall into sin if, e if Adam and Eve had made like, if they had covered their eyes with fig leaves, because it was with our eyes that we looked and saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye. So we want to cover these and maybe now this will help us avoid sin. They don't do that. It would make sense if they covered their ears. They took fig leaves and they covered their ears because we don't want to listen to the devil's temptations anymore. It would make sense if they took fig leaves and they made gloves because it was with their hands that they reached out and they took it. But none of that happens. They look at each other and they realize, whoa, everything is wrong. Look at how different we are. I can't control my thoughts anymore. I can't control what I'm thinking about you. Um, and so this is what they cover. I mean, the ramifications of the fall into sin now are just so deep and so dire um, that this is what they do. Verses 9 through 13. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I, I hid. And the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. I mentioned this before. Notice who, whom God addresses first compared to uh, the serpent. Um, Adam blames Eve and God, right? It's not just my wife tempted me. It's the woman you gave me. Everything was fine before she came along. How different? How far have we fallen? It was just the end of the last chapter where where Adam broke out into the most beautiful Hebrew song I think that's probably ever been written. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. I mean, that serene moment. Um, and now what? Adam's got no problem throwing her under the bus. Just like that, right? Um, Eve blames the serpent, right? Not, not directly blaming God, but it's almost kind of like this, this creature of yours, right? It wasn't my fault. It was this, this serpent. No one takes responsibility and nothing's changed. Here's that last point. Eating the forbidden fruit may seem like no big deal, but keep these points in mind. God had given this command and this was the only thing he required of them so that they had a way to express their love and worship for him. All right. Um, we're going to stop there because it's eight o'clock. Um, we're going to we're going to pick up next week and kind of get into how does God respond to this? Well, first of all, God is going to list out for Adam and Eve and you and me all of the, the sad effects now that are going to be true. Now that sin is in the world. Now that death is a real thing. Um, but he's also going to follow that up with what we consider and call the, the first gospel promise. 
So uh, God doesn't just make the promise to send a savior on Christmas evening when Jesus is born. God makes the promise to send a savior immediately after sin enters the world. Right? Um, my take, if I were God, would have been scrap it, let's start over. Right? Let's make some tweaks and some, some changes. God says, nope, I love these people too much. These fallen, rebellious, sinful creatures, I can't just get rid of them. I can't give up on them. I'm going to save them. And that's the promise that we're, we're going to look at next week. All right? Any questions you have before we? Certainly, uh, God knew everything, so he knew already what was going to happen in the future, right? Sure. So, I think it's still a pretty good thing. So, just looking at it from a human perspective, but it's yeah. pretty, uh, pretty amazing. I would never thought of it. Right. Well, and this is why, right, the, the Bible will talk about how, you know, you, you and I have been chosen to be God's people from before the, the, the creation of the world. Before God even laid the foundations of the world, he knew you and had you in mind that he would save you. And, and, and there's a lot of questions that want to follow that. But I would say, just step back and, and look at it from this perspective. That if you knew all of the deep, dark, inner thoughts and capabilities and sinful weaknesses of another human being, and that all of those deep, dark, sinful thoughts and actions were targeted against you, what would you want to have to do with that? God's solution is to save them, to forgive them. Um, mine, yours probably would not be so. And the whole point of that is to say, here's the theme of this class. Really, the theme of the entire Bible is grace. The only explanation for why does God treat me with the kind of love and forgiveness and joy and peace that he does, the only possible explanation could be that he is just that gracious. Thanks be to God for that. Yeah? Okay. All right, so we'll stop there. Good to see everybody tonight. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you later.